uh, we are at the uh, final stretch of a, a marathon, I would say, uh, that was uh, Scala 3. And I'm essentially going to report on uh, the, the finishing uh, touches that we put on it and where we are. Uh, and we're really very, very close to the finish line here. So here's the timeline of the countdown. Uh, the work on DOTI, which is essentially the project that led to Skylar 3, started uh, a long time ago. It was about uh, almost eight years ago, uh, so in the end of uh, 2012, uh, which uh, I, I started personally to work on essentially a successor version of Scala, a version of Scala that would be uh, essentially where we could start with a clean sheet of paper and said, well, if we could redesign everything, what would we do? And uh, there were some things that were already quite clear then and other things uh, we were, were hypotheses that were tried out and in the end abandoned. So it essentially was a, a typical research project. You try out many things and some of them stick, some of them are successes, others you decide are not worth uh, it to, to, to be included. So those were the early years until maybe about 2016. When uh, and by this by this time I had assembled a group uh, mostly at EPFL to work on Dotty and we had a, a regular release schedule uh, starting with Dotty 01 and then you got a new release every six weeks uh, after that so we started to be serious about actually releasing this stuff um, and uh, in 2018 at the Scala Days in Berlin. Uh, the, we made and communicated the, the, the decision that DOTI will be Scala 3. So that was a discussion between the stakeholders uh, of the community of Lightband, uh, Scala 2 people, uh, that uh, we said, okay, so the current research project DOTI will be the next version of Scala. And of course, then there was also uh, still a lot of work to be done, uh, uh, bugs to be fixed, uh, features to be tried out, to be fleshed out. Uh, quite a few things have, have, have changed still between 2018 and now. But now we're uh, reaching the, the finish. Um, so what uh, the last Dotty release uh, was uh, happened in August 2020, and that was Dotty 027. And um, now the next release after that, so that was at the beginning of this month, is the first Scala 3 milestone. So we have Scala 3.0 M1. So the main difference or one of the big differences between the two is that previously the artifacts were, were called essentially dotties as hyphen something. And now the artifacts are called Scala and the tools are called Scala C and things like that. So it's basically the same tooling experience uh, and or the same tooling setup that you know from Scala 2. So we're, we're getting serious now. It's really the, the successor, the Scala successor that is being ready. Uh, we expect that there, there will be a second M2 um, in, uh, in a couple of weeks from now. And we plan before the end of the year to go into the final release candidate. So Scala 3.0 RC1 is due in December 2020. Uh, and then it's a typical release schedule. So after the release candidate is out, uh, the only things that are still allowed to be done are critical bug fixes. And as early as possible afterwards, we'll go into the final release. So uh, the um, critical bug fixes here uh, would be security bugs or if something doesn't work at all, but normally that will be it. So we expect that, that the final release could be out uh, well, for something as big uh, a jump as Scala 3, you don't really know uh, too much, but maybe January or February next year, should, should we should be done. So uh, it's not just the, um, the, uh, the, the Scala uh, 2 uh, tool, it is Scala tooling that has moved and the, the, the core, uh, I'm also very happy that a lot of libraries already exist for Scala 3. So the ecosystem has uh, done a big effort already to move. Uh, as of uh, October, we had more than 100 libraries. I think uh, right now the count is 150 libraries that have already been ported to 3. So you can expect when 3 comes out that not only you will have the bare bones tooling, uh, but the, the most of the ecosystem or a large part of the ecosystem will already have migrated. 
So uh, the libraries include, um, uh, well, here with the tongue in cheek, they do not include a standard library. And that's actually one of the strengths of uh, the Scala 3 uh, effort is that Scala 3 will run with Scala 2.13 as the standard library. It will be binary compatible with Scala 2.13. And that means that uh, essentially you do not have to change both the language and the library, and that's a big help in porting. Uh, you could say, well, why would uh, uh, libraries have to um, move then at all? I mean, what does change? Well, first is uh, some, some of the language changes. So there are some rewrites there. And then the big one is macros have changed. So that's, that's the main difficulty right now for libraries to move. But they are serious about it, uh, about moving. So uh, there's uh, a large list of libraries uh, that have already been ported uh, in particular uh, some, some, or a lot of the big frameworks have ported uh, to three. Uh, Zio uh, exists in, in three, Cats Effect exists in three, Scala Z exists. Uh, most of the Howie libraries have been ported. Uh, that was an effort where Scala Center uh, was, was involved a lot. Anatoly Kmietuk uh, did a lot of that work with the help of others. Uh, so we, by the time three is out or soon after, we hope to have essentially the complete how you stack, including including Ammonite, uh, ported as well. So uh, there's a lot of effort, porting efforts still going on, and a lot of people really have done uh, very very hard work doing that. So here's just a, a tweet from November seven, Lars, uh, who said uh, a lot of people, myself included, are currently hard at work making Scala open source ecosystem migration to the, the, the upcoming Darty three zero zero happen. And here. <laughs> Uh, a bit earlier said tissue wipes sweat from bro and shows what has to be had to be done to port these kind of parallel collections to Dutty. So uh, one core uh, of the porting effort is the so-called community build. Uh, there's a Scala 3 community build which collects a number of projects that are recompiled and tested on each uh, Scala 3 pull request. So essentially that's a uh, for the continuous integration, every time we do a pull request, uh, the, the whole community build gets retested. Uh, and you, as you can see, that community build already includes quite a lot of heavy hitters from uh, uh, Scala test is in there, uh, Shapeless is in there, Zio is in there, uh, Upickle, uh, Fancy, quite a lot of uh, stuff from the Singaporean stack are there. And if you want your library to be part of it, then uh, please make a pull request. Uh, so essentially help porting it to Scala 3 and make a pull request. And we will be, we, we would generally be very, very happy of including more libraries in this community build, because that's essentially the thing that keeps everything going forward. And that makes sure that we don't include breakage uh, as, as we change uh, the, the implementation and as we fix bugs. So what about the tooling, what exists? Uh, so there's a uh, new uh, Scala 3 compiler that's uh, rewritten from scratch. Well, let me just try if, if I can go into, yeah, so okay. So there's a new Scala 3 compiler. Uh, that that one is uh, came from the Dotty compiler and it's to a large degree, a new implementation. So a lot of the internal structure of the Scala 3 compiler has been rewritten. Um, and uh, it, uh, the, the other big thing is the IDEs, uh, where the compiler uh, implements a, a language server with the Microsoft language server protocols. And that's in turn used by uh, the Metals IDE. Uh, and Metals is in turn used for VS Code and many others. And that I understand will also be used by the upcoming IntelliJ support for Scala 3. Uh, the other big thing is uh, the documentation tool. So there's a brand new Scala 3 doc tool uh, that's based on our Tasty format. So Tasty uh, is essentially our internal format that con contains everything that you, essentially all aspects of a Scala 3 uh, file, uh, of, a, of a Scala 3 top level class are contained in the Tasty file. And that includes documentation. And that is essentially rendered and made and organized and made visible 
by a, a, a documentation tool built on Docker. So both the metals and Docker are efforts of uh, Virtus Lab, who has helping our effort of tooling a lot recently with, with uh, essentially many very valuable additions and contributions. Uh, build tools, we have support for both SPP and MIL and uh, there's support for others through Gloop, which is essentially the sort of universal build service. And so both uh, SPT MIL and Gloop already run on Scala 3. And the other important part in particular for the next period are uh, migration helpers. So uh, tools that help you migrate, uh, there's, uh, they, those are still in the works. There will be one based on Scala fix. Uh, there were Miriam Lachtar is the project lead and some help is already, already built into the .t compiler. So in the new Scala 3 compiler that already contains some uh, suggestions for rewrites and some and offers to do some automatic rewrites. So um, you could ask, well, what's new in, in Scala 3? Uh, if you haven't uh, really followed it, uh, I'll give you a quick rundown. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, that, 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 was, that was actually, I apologize, that was actually a slide that should, uh, that should come later. So uh, let, let me skip that and go, go on and uh, talk a little bit more about the new compiler. So uh, why a new compiler? Well, uh, one thing was that um, since we wanted to experiment with the language and in particular also with the foundations of the language, that means that essentially the type theory and the calculus underlying the language, it seemed that it would be too much friction to always essentially change the existing code base. Uh, so that's why, we, why I decided uh, uh, to essentially start from scratch and redo it all from scratch uh, at the time. At the time it was not really uh, uh, a project that was used by many people. So velocity was more important than essentially battle testedness. Uh, but the other thing that as it, we developed it further, I, I believe we have some uh, advantages already in the new compiler compared to the old one. In particular, uh, I think it's a lot more correct in hairy type checking things such as variance checking or GADTs or type class or implicit resolution. So all these things have been essentially rethought, redesigned from the ground up. And uh, I believe they are much more on, we are here on much more solid ground than we were in the Scala 2 compiler. The other thing that um, should be a bonus is that in many cases, the uh, the new compiler infers better than the old one. So the inferencing pre precision has been increased quite a bit. Uh, of course, if you port code now, then uh, the, the issue is that the, it could be that uh, essentially some of the things don't work out uh, the same way. And uh, that, that means you need an additional type annotation or, or something like that. And in fact, the purpose of the rewrite tools that are in the works is exactly to essentially automate that process, add, add type annotations as necessary to help you over the, over the bump. But uh, one should also see that essentially the status quo is uh, typically code that has been, uh, people have wrestled with the Scala 2 compiler in order to essentially get their stuff through type checking. So if there's a tiny amount of breakage now, that's only natural. On the other hand, a lot of the wrestling for new code will not be necessary anymore because the Scala 3 compiler is essentially in, a, in, a, in many areas a, a lot better at inferring the correct types. So it's, uh, it might seem a bit difficult right now when you migrate, but I promise that in the long run, uh, it will be a much more pleasant experience. Uh, the other thing that I believe greatly improves the experience is the error messages. Uh, I believe that the new compiler has a much better error messages. It starts with sort of uh, syntax highlighting and stuff like that. So your error messages now come in colors, uh, but it doesn't end there by a long shot. So I believe the most important part, for instance, is if you miss um, an implicit import or something like that, then now the compiler will actually tell you, it will make you suggestions what to import to, 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 to make this program work. And that was something that previously was, uh, was, uh, was really sorely missing because when uh, there was uh, some, some implicit missing, then you were basically on your own. I believe actually that the 
people at JetBrains have also made uh, quite a lot of progress and some of that is already in the Scala plugin for IntelliJ right now. So in that sense, we have a parallel improvement in two and three, which is great to, great to see. Uh, and the final thing is uh, a lot of people ask, well, what about compilation speed? And uh, I would say it's, it's a, it's, it's a race uh, in, in a sense. So uh, in some of, uh, but Scala 3 is definitely competitive. So I have a tweet here uh, from Eugene who said that uh, Kenji Yoshida, he reported 45% uh, speed improvement for I think Scala Z integration. Uh, so that that's uh, very, very nice to see. So it clearly in some large code bases, Scala 3 is, uh, significantly faster than Scala 2, but I wouldn't bet it would be that for all code bases. I think uh, it, it might be somewhat slower for others and it might be head to head on others. It's a continuous improvement definitely, so we're not at the end of the road yet. We, uh, we uh, decided to essentially con concentrate on functionality on correctness first, and, uh, uh, but uh, we will also uh, definitely watch uh, performance and hopefully improve performance in the future. So learning and teaching, uh, there's also a lot happening. Uh, so there's uh, the uh, a, uh, Scala 3 book in the works. Uh, there are many people contributing to that. Uh, Alvin Alexander, Eric Lotz from Lunatech, uh, Julien Richard Foy from Scala Center, Noel Welsh from Underscore and, and others. So it's a collective effort to get essentially something, uh, a, a reference on the web, uh, which uh, gives you a comprehensive uh, uh, and indexable view of the whole of Scala 3. Then uh, if you don't like to read so much, but uh, prefer videos, then uh, a lot of uh, MOOCs have been uh, converted or uh, are being written from scratch. So um, I have over the summer converted my two MOOCs on principles of functional programming and functional program design. Uh, to Scala 3. That was a big effort, it took me about three months or so to do that, but it's all in the box now and it will be released uh, uh, probably at the same time as the Scala 3 final release. We, we plan to switch the MOOCs also to support it. Uh, there's also a new uh, massive open online course uh, called Effective Scala that's done by Julian Richard Foy and others. So that aims to be a, a more hands-on and less academic introduction to Scala. So something less for university students and more for programmers who want to the whole package essentially, what, what, what build tool do you to, to use, uh, how to set up your system and so on. So that will all be in Effective Scala and it's coming along very nicely. I will also uh, teach Scala 3 from the start. And finally, I should mention the Lunatech online courses, which uh, Lunatech has been very early on in Scala 3 teaching, and uh, they, they have been great in essentially tracking the final changes of the language and being out there and teaching others to use it. Uh, uh, the, uh, besides Lunatech, there's also a new effort, which is very exciting, uh, uh, that uh, is uh, called Scala Zone. Um, where uh, the uh, Scala Zone is a free online learning platform for Scala 3 with uh, lessons, videos, and so on. And that's a collective effort of uh, John Pretty and Virtus Lab. So now what's new in Scala 3? Um, the, uh, maybe instead of um, looking at the slides, I just take you directly to the webpage because I think that that webpage actually is, is a good starting point. Uh, so let me just uh, change the share. There we go. So um, if you look at the Dotty documentation, that's uh, Dotty docs. Uh, so that essentially gives you a comprehensive overview of everything that is that is new in in the language. Uh, it's still called Dotty. We will change it to Scala three uh, or uh, once the, essentially it gets merged with the books. So the Scala three book is all about essentially the language as as a, as as it will be as a whole, and the Dotty documentation is basically about the delta. So uh, if I take you to the reference, uh, so that's essentially the language reference, uh, and that tells you first uh, what the goals were for for our language. Uh, so the uh, main uh, important things is we wanted to strengthen the foundations um, 
and we want to make Scala easier and safer to use. In particular, that means taming powerful constructs such as implicits and remove warts and puzzlers. So those were the, the, uh, the main two goals. Uh, number three goal was to improve consistency and expressiveness of Scala's language constructs. But the, uh, the, the, so the main focus is make it sort of clearer what the language is and make the language itself easier and safer to use. And according to these things, we have essentially classified the changes that happened there. So uh, you see here the um, essential foundations. I'm just gonna pick one of each one. So one thing that is fundamentally new in, in Scala 3 is union types. Uh, so where we have types A or B, which have all the values of type A and also the, all the values of type B. So it's an untagged union. Uh, what you can, what you do is not have an left or right as with either, uh, but you, if you have a union like that, let, let's say an ID, which is a username or a password, then you can then match on it. And you can say, well, if it's a username here on this case, so you do just a normal pattern match, then do something. And if it's a pass password, then uh, do the other thing. So that was uh, one of the uh, essential additions that we had and there are quite a few others as well. Simplifications, uh, so there have, quite, have been quite a few uh, simplifications that you see here and some of them replace more uh, complicated stuff. Uh, so for instance, straight parameters that replace early initializers, uh, extension methods, uh, opaque type aliases that replace most usage of value classes and so on. I'll just pick one again, I'll, I'll pick extension methods. Uh, that's the one that essentially is slated to uh, replace implicit classes, uh, where the idea of both extension methods and implicit classes is you want to add some methods to an existing class. So for instance, here you have the very simple example that you say my existing class is a case class circle, and I have an extension that adds a circumference method to the circle. So you write that now as follows, you say extension, and then what you extend, so that would be a parameter, a value called C of type circle, and then that's the method that you add here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, th that can also work for operators. So here you see that you can essentially add operators less than to two strings, So here a, a, a cons operator to elements and sequence of elements, or here a min element to numbers, you can all can do all these things. Uh, they can be generic um, and they uh, can be uh, collective. So what collective means is that uh, we can have one extension syntax and here, in this case, we extend sequences of strings and we can add several methods to do the same thing without having to repeat the thing we extend and possibly type parameters and bounds of type parameters and so on uh, for, for all of that. So extension methods took a long time to settle. Uh, I remember I was here a couple of years back um, and gave a talk on what I then thought was the definite design of extension methods. Uh, it's, it's still changed quite a bit, but I'm really happy with what we have now. So I used that extensively both in my own code and in my teaching and it really works well. So it's something that is, is, comes quite naturally. And in particular, I like this, I, this uh, notion that extension method syntax is, is lightweight enough to do, to be able to uh, you have single extension methods, but it's also powerful enough that you can go to multiple methods uh, and, and uh, have something that, that, uh, that works well for that use case as well. Originally, we concentrated on the single method case only, but that turned out then in, when we started to use this heavily in, in the compiler and in other tools, that turned out to lead to a lot of uh, annoying repetition. Uh, and uh, so we went back to the drawing board and came up with this. And I think that that is really something that, that works well. Okay, so uh, let me go on. Then we have quite a few restrictions as well, where we found that uh, the, the previous ways of doing things uh, was unnecessarily dangerous or unsound. Uh, so certain things have been dropped, uh, like uh, type projection has been dropped. Uh, certain things have been uh, restricted, uh, like implicit conversions, and certain things aim to give you a more consistent user experience. Uh, 
because I, um, the, if you look at Scala, then uh, the uh, complexity of the language is not really in the language itself. Scala is a fairly small language. It's smaller than other languages in the JVM space, including Java. Uh, so there are fewer constructs in Scala than in Java, but it's essentially a, an add-on effect that you say people don't just use the language, they use libraries on top of the language. So if libraries have widely differing uh, conventions, then it's a problem. And if furthermore, the applications using this, uh, these libraries have widely differing uh, conventions, then that's even more a problem. So infix annotations are a way to essentially tame this uh, general a little bit. So the, the, the big question here is, uh, if you have a um, call a, a, a call a method like union, do you call it like this as one dot union is two, or do you call it like this? Previously, you called you could call it both ways, and uh, people did, uh, and uh, including in the same source file. So you you would find both syntaxes because maybe it was it was written by several people and they had different preferences, and that was all okay. Uh, from the language perspective, that actually leads to a simpler language. It's more orthogonal uh, because all we had to say in Scala is to say, well, um, uh, there are methods. Methods can be alphanumeric or symbolic, and uh, they can be uh, called with a dot or infix. Uh, we didn't have to make any further distinctions. So that was a simplification on the language level, but it was not a simplification on the user experience because the user experience was well you saw these in the inconsistent usages so infix helps there because infix with infix the rule now is you use by default the second syntax only so that's essentially uh, the uh, the prescribed view the recommended thing so write methods in the traditional method uh, called syntax and not infix but sometimes you might want to you want, might want to override that well one thing to override that, of course, would be for operators. So there, of course, operators, you write infix always. Uh, so you can use the method name syntax, but nobody really does because it's just a lot more ugly than the operators. But what about normal alphanumeric names? So there the, uh, the answer is, well, if you, as a library designer, as a library author, you think they should be written infix, uh, you can make that choice by adding an infix annotation. And if you add that annotation, then essentially uh, your users are encouraged to write it in fix. They can write it with normal method uh, syntax, but again, I would, I would assume that in this case, you have, you have thought hard why it should be in fix. So you will make that case, case and the users will follow you. But for all other methods, so normal methods, all other methods will be written in the normal method called syntax. If you write an in fix in, then you will get a warning. Uh, you won't get the warning in 3.0 uh, because essentially we have to take some time to take uh, tame the code base, but it will come in 3.1. Okay, so that was the uh, uh, the restrictions. Uh, dropped constructs, there have been quite a few uh, delayed in it, existential types. Uh, XML literals will be dropped. They're still there, but they're on their way out. Symbol literals. Uh, auto application, weak conformance, compound types. So but what we tried here really is to not just add features, but really to essentially also to get rid of features if we now think that the feature is inessential, uh, can be encoded easily by other means and has or has been replaced by something that makes more sense. Um, Changes uh, of the language, uh, I believe the most important changes uh, and the most important cleanup is really the cleanups to implicit resolution where there has been a lot of essentially polishing in details. And I think that avoids a lot of surprises that you had before. Uh, so not all of them, but I think it's a definite improvement. And then there are the new constructs. Uh, so uh, a big uh, new construct is, um, enums, which uh, provide a concise syntax for enumerations and Azure Back data types. So I jump to the data type immediately. So uh, what you can write uh, to essentially make this, uh, to make a concise option, you can write enum option and it has a sum case or it has a num case. And that's essentially a, uh, 
a, a special case, case of the, those uh, the enum syntax are the classical enumerations like color, case red, green, blue, that essentially give you three cases that do not have any parameters. So enums are a nice way if you have a lot of data to define. If you have a lot of classes, ADTs, uh, 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 algebraic data types uh, to define, then enums are a nice shorthand for those things because uh, you don't need to write a lot of classes and objects and extends clauses and so on. So for that, they're actually quite quite, quite good, but they, in fact, they map into uh, class hierarchies. So they're not something that is essentially uh, a radically new construct. They're just nice syntactic sugar on top of the class hierarchies. Here's another one that uh, is a very recent addition and uh, I, am, I am quite uh, pleased with it. It's the uh, target name annotation. So target name uh, used to be called alpha. Uh, and it's another thing to essentially get more usability. Uh, this time, the original motivation for target name was that it addresses the, uh, the problem of overuse of symbolic operators. I think that uh, the peak of that is definitely behind us. People are more careful with symbolic operators, uh, but it sort of lingers that people say, oh, Scala is unreasonable because of all these uh, symbolic operators. And it's true that if you have a symbolic operator, then uh, it's hard to Google for one. Uh, so how, how should I even, and, and it's even hard to pronounce. How should I call plus plus equals? Well, plus plus equals is fine, but if it's something with uh, percent dollar or whatever, so how do I call this thing? So now you know how to call it because it's recommended uh, that you add a target name annotation to anything that is symbolic. So here we have this, uh, plus plus equals with the uh, target name. And uh, that means that the plus plus equals method now is should be called append. And uh, that's essentially something that you can Google for, but it's also something that you can use for interop because when the method gets compiled, it will be called append. So previously it would have been called dollar plus, dollar plus, dollar eq or something. Yeah, I think that was the encoding. So essentially every uh, operator uh, symbol got, had its own encoding and then we concatenated them. That's of course completely unusable if you want to call this thing from Java, say. Uh, so now the, the plus plus equals has the name append in the bytecode. So it's very easy to call it from Java. You just use append. Also, uh, the, it's, it will be the append thing that will show up in stack traces or things like that. So that should also make it more e e easier on, the, on that side. Okay, so that's essentially already two benefits. Uh, it explains what a symbolic operator is and it helps with interop, but it, still, it even has a, a third one. And that third benefit is that it avoids the dreaded, um, has the same name after erasure errors. So what are these errors? So the issue is that uh, Scala has a much richer type system than uh, the JVM bytecode. Uh, by now, every JVM language has a much richer type system than the JVM bytecode. The JVM bytecode corresponds to Java, Java 1.4, uh, so pre-generics. And that means that sometimes things that look different in the source have actually the same type in the bytecode. So for instance, if you have here these two definitions of the F, then uh, what would happen is these are call by name parameters. They get both mapped to a type which is called function zero. So the uh, bytecode uh, type of F would be in both cases, it takes a function zero and returns an int. And of course that would be a double definition in the bytecode. So you can't do that. The compiler will refuse it and saying, well, essentially these two versions of F have the same um, name and signature after erasure. But the question is, what can you do with that if you have that? So uh, there's not much you can do. Previously, the best thing that you could do was a, a, to add a dummy parameter to one of them, which is kind of ugly. So now you can just give one of them or both of them, if you so choose a target name. And that will resolve the conflict because now you don't have two versions of F in the bytecode. You have F underscore string and F. So that takes care of the problem. So in the future, whenever you get these uh, erasure conflicts, which I know can be very, very annoying, uh, target name can, can essentially save you uh, there every time. Just have to, to add the proper target names and you're done. Okay, cool. 
So that was uh, that. And um, let me go back to the uh, to the normal slides now. Um, okay. Good. So uh, I just skip these. Yeah. So here's a list of uh, replacements, which I think is also important to see what we what we where we migrate. So uh, instead of package objects, uh, there's a new uh, idea to that you can write every definition top level. You don't. You can have a top level def. You can have a top level val. And uh, if you uh, want to model something like inheritance of package objects, and you have a thing called exports that essentially give you aggregation, uh, so proper comp composition instead of inheritance. Then uh, implicits on many of these things, defs, vals, objects, conversions have been replaced by givens. Instead of implicit classes, you have extension methods, those I was showing. And instead of macros, you have a new macro system that is based on inline staging and match types. So that gives you a new foundation for metaprogramming, which uh, is uh, a lot uh, cleaner than uh, what we had so far. Uh, so, um, so far what we have for uh, macros, which are, uh, as you know, still experimental, even eight years after they were first released, um, is essentially a spilling the guts of the old Scala 2 compiler, let me say it this way. So essentially it opened up quite a lot of um, things that I believe should have stayed internal for the macro user, uh, for the macro library uh, user. Uh, plus side, it's super powerful. Uh, you get access to essentially uh, lots and lots of details of the compiler. So you can do uh, lots of lots and lots of things uh, quite, quite advanced. Uh, minus, it's super dangerous. Uh, so what you do here, it wasn't really meant to be uh, used for, for for public consumption. And uh, the the other thing is, it's super unprincipled because uh, what you what you do is basically a snapshot of a particular compiler code base. And no matter how well that code base is designed, it's still a snapshot. So the new system is a lot more. Uh, uh, fundamental. Uh, so it uses uh, things that are quite well known and it uses things that essentially compose. So there's one axis which is uh, just inlining uh, and there's another which is called staging, which uses quotes and splices. Uh, if you mer merge the two, then you get already quite powerful macros. Uh, the, uh, uh, the macros that you get that way have been explored first in uh, Meta or Camel. So Meta or Camel is a predecessor that uh, does things uh, quite similarly uh, to, to what we do here. If you need to do uh, go further, then we have a second layer that is based on uh, reflection on our tasty. So that is essentially a more implementation oriented view, but it's a view that essentially is opt in and uh, hopefully in many, many parts of macro implementations never have to touch that. And even if it's off opt in, then as you'll see, the tasty format is actually one thing that we will standardize and we will keep stable. So we will guarantee that this is kept stable over a very, very long time. Okay, uh, and then there are essentially two big, big ones. Um, uh, one is uh, the replacement of implicits and the other is indentation. Uh, so that's essentially uh, two uh, monumental changes from two to three. Uh, so let me say a couple of words for each. So uh, the replacement of implicit is essentially a rethinking of term inference. So term inference means that given a type T, uh, generate a, a canonical value of that type, generate some value that has that type. So that's essentially what happens in implicit search and also happens in uh, uh, type classes and happens in a lot of code synthesis tasks, which are essentially more advanced and more research oriented. So the core is always, I have a type or some other description and the compiler will actually make up a, a value uh, that has that type. Uh, so, uh, 
the previous uh, thing that uh, Scala used for that was implicits, which were, I, I have argued in previous talks, Scala's most distinguished features, but also the most controversial one. Um, and uh, the givens are essentially a complete redesign from scratch uh, that I believe are a lot simpler and safer. Uh, they emphasize intent, what you want to achieve over the mechanism, how you achieve it. And I believe they make the idea of inference more accessible and they avoid uh, quite a lot of abuses right now. So hopefully uh, I know that term inference and implicits are both always very powerful, that will stay that way, and always therefore uh, adv an advanced feature, a feature that essentially is, is uh, a bit hard to grapple with. But I think that we sort of have avoided as much as we could accidental complexity that got added by the previous implicit uh, implementation, which uh, in its defense, uh, one should say that is, is something that uh, was pioneering a lot of the things that didn't exist before. And it was uh, something that grew over time. Uh, so uh, in, in that sense, if something sort of, if the original spec for implicits was something that uh, was not what the final uh, implementation was and it had it, it grew and there's some some unfortunate things that that happen over time with that so givens are sort of the opportunity for a restart there so here's uh, the uh, I, I, uh, intro for givens uh, the it's sort of the standard type class intro uh, where you say uh, with if you do type classes then uh, what you have is a uh, trait uh, ordered of t is a as an example, and ordering so order of t that would be sort of the correspondence to ordering in the standard library. So here it has two extension methods, as it happens, uh, compared to and uh, oops, there's a, it's actually a mistake here. It's uh, it's uh, yeah. Well, let me just fix this. I can do that. Okay, real real time slide amelioration. So the extension method has uh, the two extension methods. One is called compare to, and the other is called less, and it calls compare to. So that's my trait. Uh, parameter is traits like that. We often call type classes. And um, then I have an implementation of the trait that I said, well, I want to have ordering implemented for ints. And here's how I do that. All I need to do is I have to give you the implementation of this abstract compare to method. And here's what the implementation is. So if X is less than one, yeah, well, you see the implementation here. Now I have an instance of this ORT type class. So now how do I use that? So the most fun fundamental way I can use that is with a using clause. So a using clause is uh, what used to be called an implicit parameter clause. So you just write it uh, with other parameters. It can be mixed. It can also come first uh, now, um, but here it comes last. So you say using order of T. So that says, well, it, you, it needs a evidence that T is ordered using order of t, that's what it says. And then I can essentially just use it and I will use it uh, not by name, not call, by referring to it, but by just passing it on to the less than method here, basically. So what's important here is, is that uh, to make this all work, what does not matter? So the thing that does not matter are the names of these things. So what is the given uh, uh, instance for order, uh, for, for order of int called? You can name it if you want, but you don't have it. Likewise, uh, what is the evidence that uh, I, uh, T is ordered called? You can give it a name, but again, you don't need to. And typically you don't. In particular, if you just pass this on to others, then the name is actually something that is irrelevant and therefore should be left out. So that's a big change compared to the previous implicits where you often have to name these things and uh, that, led, that often leads to just uh, more obscure code. Uh, another thing that the combination of extension methods and givens uh, provides you is really nice support for type classes. So he here you have a standard example uh, of again semigroup and monoid. So, he so here you have the combined method and a monoid is a semigroup with unit 
And then you have a uh, type class instance, monoid of string, where essentially we give you both an uh, instance for the combine method. We implement combine and we implement unit. And here we have a usage of, uh, of the uh, monoid uh, in the sum method, which uses a context bound. So context bounds work, of course, also for this new given. <coughs> So if you try to do this uh, before in Scala 2, then uh, it would have been quite complicated in particular with infix methods. So uh, if you want uh, combine to be used infix, uh, then uh, so as a, no, sorry, as a, just as a method, not as a binary function, uh, then uh, you have to jump to quite a lot of hoops with implicit classes and so on. So by the time you're done, uh, you uh, you probably rec don't recognize the structure of your solution anymore because of all the accidental complexities to actually get these methods to be callable with the right dots and so on. So that has all gone away. Uh, and I think now the solution is as clear as it could be. Uh, another thing that has changed is implicit conversions. Uh, so implicit conversions, uh, the more we use them, the more we are convinced that they are really uh, have to be uh, tamed and restricted a lot. Uh, and one uh, good start of this is that now implicit conversions are not essentially a feature by themselves anymore, but they are a uh, instance of a standard implicit class conversion. So to do a conversion from string to token, you write given conversion and then you write the, you have to implement an apply method that essentially does the conversion of string to token. You can also uh, make this shorter by using a so-called alias given. So you can say the given conversion from string to token is the keyword method that essentially takes a string here and returns a token. So that was a very quick, I don't have more time, uh, overview of uh, what happens in the uh, implicit. Uh, if you look at the doc uh, pages again, there's a whole sub uh, chapter on that a whole uh, uh, sub menu tab on contextual abstractions. so contextual abstractions collect everything that actually happens in that area uh, the other big one and very controversial one uh, are optional braces so what uh, scala 3 does is it makes curly braces and parentheses also i should say option more places um, so instead of braces, one can use indented blocks. Now it's worthwhile to say that braces are actually optional now. So uh, some would write a, a program that you see here like this with the braces here and here. But the braces here, the second braces here, they are not needed because the else part of the if then else is actually a single expression. So some people actually leave out the braces Sorry, some people leave it out like that. Also, there's an, there's the issue which I personally don't don't really like aesthetically that the else hides between behind a closing brace uh, in in the line. So it really should be if and else on the same level. But no, uh, with this style you write closing brace and then the else. So some people write it differently. Again, they write closing brace here and then the else on the new line. So there's also quite a lot of variation. In, um, in formatting. And finally, even the, with the parents of the conditions, there's variations uh, the, where uh, sometimes you write a space and some, sometimes you don't. So I said, there's actually quite a lot of variation already in writing these things. So in the future, what will happen is that you can now also write it like this. So you can also leave out the braces here completely as long as these two things are indented uh, that's okay. Uh, and that uh, avoids a lot of essentially uh, busy work going back and forth with the braces. And it also, frankly, avoids a lot of errors because I, I don't know about you, but I often made the error before that I just added the thing and then I forgot to add the braces. And then the program behaved in mysterious ways uh, that often were easy to, to find out, but sometimes were not. And uh, while we're at, at that to remove the braces, we, uh, we are actually also now removing the parents. So you can also write it like this with an explicit then afterwards. And that means you don't have to write the condition in parents anymore. Uh, and once we did that, there were actually also 
quite a lot of other uses where we got rid of braces and parents. So these are all really, no, sorry, um, legal syntax. So you can write for uh, without parents or braces around the generators. Uh, you have a do for a while. You don't need braces in the optional uh, in the match statement anymore, nor do you need them in the try. Um, before um, we uh, discuss that, and uh, I think the, the discussion would be endless, what I want to do is just show you what it looks like. Um, so this is just some real world Scala code. It's part of the compiler, uh, was written the whole thing after the, uh, the change to, to the thing. So, so that's just one thing that essentially it does a flow analysis for nullability uh, in, in, in the compiler. So when something can be null and when it can't be null. So what you see is you have a case class and here you have is empty, uh, you have sequence. Uh, you have out. So I just want to give you uh, an overview of what that looks like. So I think what the the conclusion or the what the take back is, it looks actually very quiet. So it looks uh, sort of quite Bauhaus and not so much Baroque. So it's Bauhaus instead of Baroque, I would say. It's, it's a very clean uh, visual aspect that doesn't really use a lot of sort of spurious elements. We got rid of semicolons a long time ago. So now getting rid of braces adds to that. Um, the other thing I believe it shows is that uh, it's, it's, this, uh, it's more condensed uh, vertically. Uh, so closing braces in particular, long sequences of closing braces, they tend to, 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 to take up a lot of vertical space, uh, which is no longer an issue. Uh, so uh, that helps uh, by itself. Uh, what we have seen in our code, we get at least a 10% reduction in line, line count uh, by going to this essentially uh, braceless uh, syntax. Uh, um, so uh, another thing that I haven't mentioned, but that I believe also is huge by itself is that now you can write operators in front. Uh, and I believe that's really where they should have been all, all along. Uh, because it makes things just so much clearer to visually to, to, to actually parse, to say I have this is track condition and I say, well, I have one condition here and then or, and then uh, the, now I do have to write braces, uh, uh, with, uh, but here the conditions here, they actually line up with and, uh, ampersands in the front. So I know immediately that this is a, a, a conjunction of several conditions, whereas otherwise I would always have to look at the right at the, at the line ends, which are much much harder to spot. Um, so uh, the the braces here are still needed. Uh, there there could be some uh, extensions in the future where they will be optional as well, but that will not appear in three zero. So that will that that that's left for for future once the ecosystem has migrated here. Okay. Uh, let me just go back to the to the part. Okay, so um, one second. I just have to get my. Just noted I was not on power. So okay, good. So let's um, quickly uh, go go on. So optional braces were very controversial. So in, they were added initially as an experimental feature. Uh, they're, they're now used quite heavily by myself and some of some people in the core team for more than a year. And I've uh, taught them in class twice. And I must say the experience has been positive beyond all expectations. It's for me, it's it's, it sounds weird, I know, but it's the single most important way how Scala 3 has improved my productivity. You could say, well, how, how is a trivial syntactic feature like that more important than, let's say, all the new contextual abstraction designs or extension methods or uh, inline and staging and all these things. But for me, that's, that, that was the one, the one thing because it's just it makes code cleaner, easier to read, uh, easier to write. Uh, and, and, and avoids the, the busy work of adding and, and removing these braces. Programs become shorter, uh, like I said already, and you stay in, oh, sorry, and you stay in the flow. So there's no need to go back and forth inserting, the, inserting these braces. So if I should put it in a single sentence, then I would say writing 
code based on indentation is really like Lego bricks. You have statements, you put them together at the right point, uh, you uh, click together and that's it. Whereas bracing the braces, they're like bailing wires. So you have something and now you have more than one thing. And I said, oh, it, my God, it falls all apart. We have to wrap things around it, some bailing wire. And braces indeed, they look like bailing wires. So, so it's a much less pleasant experience. Um, there were a lot of doomsayers before that would say this is going to be terrible for refactoring and so on. In my experience, nothing. So program changes were more reliable than with braces. Of course, details matter. So I, I don't want to advocate any indentation design. And in fact, we took some time, uh, quite some time in several trials, but I think now we got it mostly right. So all this has been uh, looked after in the SIP process. The Scala Improvement Committee uh, was reviewing the complete language. All features were discussed. Some features were changed or dropped as a result of discussions. And we have also invited community feedback on Scala contributors uh, for uh, almost all of those features by now. Good. So uh, to uh, quickly uh, finish, uh, is Scala 3 then a new language? And you could, you could say yes. Uh, it has so many language changes. It has some things that got removed. Uh, there are new constructs that improve user experience and onboarding. Uh, all the books, all the teaching materials, all the courses will have to be rewritten. On the other hand, you could say, no, it's still Scala. Uh, uh, all core constructs rem remain in place. Um, sometimes they have a new syntactic uh, form, but essentially they map to basically the same thing. And there's a large and very practical common subset between Scala 2 and Scala 3. Uh, so uh, a, a lot of the libraries cross built between Scala 2 and Scala 3. Many of the, of the programs in the community build cross build. So I think the real, uh, the, 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 uh, the final answer there is it's, it's a process. So Scala 3.0 is not the end of the three, uh, Scala 3 development. Uh, so far, it keeps most constructs of 2.13 alongside the new ones, but the, some of the old constructs will be deprecated and phased out in future 3.3.x uh, releases. And that will essentially make them the language evolve naturally into, into a new direction. So that means that right now we do have some temporary duplication, for instance, old implicits and new givens, but I believe the end result is a more compact and regular language. So here's Josh Zureth, uh, to quote him. He said, it's very much a new experience and very much still Scala. So uh, people have criticized and said, well, why do so many things at once? And really the answer is it's the, it's the books, it's or, or courses or videos, uh, because uh, it's such a big change that uh, they will have to be rewritten and they are rewritten. There are lots of people who, essentially already get uh, get on track to change the books. So my own book that I co-authored, uh, Programming in Scala, will be rewritten. Uh, Programming Scala by Dean Wampler, he's very busy rewriting it and so on. So you expect essentially a new set of uh, documentation and materials come out. And because that is the case that as a book author, uh, if you want to do that, then you don't want to do it again a year from now or two years from now, something like that. So that means that we had to get it into 3.0 if it affects the foundations, if it simplifies life. So it's something that you want to have in the book because it simplifies life, particularly for beginners. And if it replaces an existing feature because you don't want to essentially build in obsolescence into your books. So that's why essentially it, it is in fact a big bang release. It's not, it's not a continuous improvement. So that means we prioritized foundations, simplifications for developers and restrictions and other features that essentially aim for added power and expressiveness got delayed and some of them will be added in future releases. Okay, so will this be a Python 2 to 3 situations? I don't think so. Uh, we don't need to migrate everything since we can use the 213 binaries. That I think is huge because it means that really we don't have a split in the ecosystem. We can use the same binaries from both of them. That's in a sense, the situation is even better 3.0, 2.13 
than let's say 213 versus 212, where, where you had to use either the 212 or 213 uh, version of a library. And if you still uh, depended on a 212 one, then you could not migrate to 213. That's not an issue now. You can reuse all 213 libraries in uh, Scala 3, with the exception, I should say, of macros. So macros is the big uh, uh, game changer here that where you say the Scala 3 compiler cannot expand a Scala 2 macro. On the other hand, you can have dual macro definitions in a single project. So you can have a project that is uh, cross compiles for 213 and 3, and that can that has uh, uh, macro implementations for both of them. So alternative macro implementation for 3 and 213. Some projects have started doing that. The other big uh, improvement, of course, is strong static typing, which means that, yes, there will be problems migrating, but the errors that will be detected are type errors. Uh, so you don't need to essentially uh, wait until runtime to see whether something something's break. We have been quite careful uh, in actually not changing the runtime behavior of things, including some things where we wanted uh, to change it, but then we backpedaled because we said it's just too risky. So one thing where, where I would have wanted to change the runtime behavior is in the synchronization behavior of lazy valves, which may, makes them essentially less uh, fast than they could be. Uh, and uh, then we said, well, no, we can't really in introduce new race conditions in Scala 3 programs uh, that uh, for porting code, that would be really bad. And number three, I think there are actually lots of benefits of migrating to Scala 3, unlike with Python 3 when it came, when it came out. So if you look at the situation of Scala 2 and 3, uh, what's the relationship between the two? So um, the um, uh, current situation until uh, very recently was we can read Scala 213 binaries and we actually do that by reusing the Scala 213 uh, standard library. So that's essentially the so-called Scala pickles format that can that is understood by the Scala 3 compiler. Uh, and that means you can have a Scala 2 module and a Scala 3 module that depends on it. No problem. So what we now also have and that will be in 2.13.4, so the upcoming 2.13 release is going the other way. So that's uh, called the Tasty Reader. Tasty is the Scala 3 internal format. And we can read it and uh, understand it now in the Scala 2 compiler. So, so that means you can actually write a library module in Scala 3 and uh, have it understood uh, by uh, uh, Scala 2. So, you can write your library and you can have a Scala 2 module that imports the uh, Scala 3 uh, definitions and makes use of them. So that means we now have two, uh, two way compatibility between two and three, and you can write uh, your modules in either one of the language and have it, um, have it be understood by the others. Big caveat toujours macros, of course. Um, so that brings me to say, well, how, how is the ecosystem going to evolve? So um, right now we have Scala 3, it comes with the 213 library. Uh, there will be some uh, versions in Scala 3, 3.1, 3.2 maybe, uh, that will um, essentially refine the language. So they will drop some of the features that we still support for migration purposes. So we will essentially tighten the language. And we might also introduce some new things that essentially have been left out uh, for, because we wanted to restrict the set as much as possible for three. And then there will be another big shift uh, sometime down the road. Let's call it 3.x. That will be the time when we freeze Tasty. So, taste, so, so that means that by then, essentially the whole thing will be its own platform. Uh, Scala 3 uh, files will, can be published in Tasty and can then essentially automatically cross compile to multiple platforms and multiple versions. So by then, uh, I believe that this will uh, by, by and large solve the binary compatibility problem. That will sort of be the end of times when you can stick to one version and stay, stay on that version forever because Tasty is a format that we control and that uh, we can evolve uh, and make sure we evolve that in backwards compatible ways. And that will also be the point when we finally won't need the Scala 2.13 library anymore and we can make the next big jump in the, in the standard library 
uh, and that will be also the point where then any future Scala 2 uh, versions that, that still exist will essentially consume the, uh, the, the standard library and, and the rest of it from Scala 3 through the Tasty Reader. So that's the plan. Uh, how to migrate? Uh, I'm out of time, uh, but uh, I just want to say there is a migration guide. You should look it up. It's, it's fantastic. It gives you a lot of details how to uh, get started today uh, to migrate, a lot of tips, a lot of uh, points you to a lot of help for you to do that. So that's definitely, if you Google for Scala migration guide, then that's, that's, that's the place to start. Okay, so that's the end of the talk. Thank you for, uh, for listening and staying with me so far. And uh, I'm happy to take some questions if there are.